Hey, hey everyone, this is Elisa and the founder of the Facebook group and we are hosting more than 17,000 members there. If you're not part of our community, I highly encourage you to be part of the community. And today we have Richard, one of the rare gems in the group. Like most of the people are women together. <laughs> so today we have Richard with us. He's a very dear friend and I'm so blessed and honored to call him a brother from a different mother right now because I always Richard what am I supposed to do and he's like oh you know so <laughs> anyway I want to share him with you today uh, he's not my husband so I can share him with you <laughs> so who is Richard Richard is pulling off the chair very soon yeah. Richard is an international best-selling author speaker mindset coach dating expert and podcast host. He helps men transform themselves from overthinking and afraid of failure to become the action taker to reach the next level. Alrighty, are you all ready to meet Richard? There you go. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> well, and at least and sorry, thank you so much for bringing me on here and God, I feel like, you know, I, I'm just a, a, one of your whores and you're just a pimp, right? I'm going to share Richard out. <laughs> I said, all right, women, to, I'm here for it, right? I'm ready for it. Whatever you need yeah. me to be, I am. So thank I you. Mama Elise. Sorry? Mama Elise. I'm Mama Elise. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a real pleasure to be on here on the show and just to get an honor to meet and talk with you. So I'm, I'm just excited to be here. Right. I don't know why I brought you on here, but we'll just see. <laughs> <laughs> you work with men, so tell us your story. Why dating? Why decide to be a dating coach? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, at least. Um, mm -hmm. So where did, why why do that in the first place? It's, it's, it's ridiculously stupid. Right? It's ridiculously stupid to get in that area, especially when you're single now, right? And Especially it's even worse when you come out of a relationship because then people look at you and go, you're a dating coach, but you're single now. How does that really work? Yeah, and totally so, get it. <laughs> totally get it. And just me being authentic is that, you know, so the reason why I started doing this is because, you know, a bit about my background, at least I know you know a bit, but for the viewers who are watching and listening, now I grew up, uh, I'm in Australia, Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. and my parents are Chinese, right? Chinese heritage, born in Vietnam. And so when they... When the war broke out, they had to go somewhere, right? And we were fortunate enough to come to Australia. You know, I'm one of four kids. I'm a middle child, right? And so, you know, with refugee parents in a new country, four kids, you can imagine how hard it is. Right? You can imagine mm -hmm. how hard it is. And me being one of the middle kids, you know, there's a middle child syndrome whereby it's like, oh, you know, I'm not the rebel. I'm not the, the, the golden child. I'm not the little princess because I wasn't born last. And I'm just the middle child who's just the one that stays away, who, do, who does enough to not be in trouble, but doesn't mm -hmm. feel like he does enough to actually get attention and love. And so it's like, oh, Richard's fine. He's, he's got school sort of. Oh, Richard's fine. He's, he doesn't look sad. Oh, Richard's fine. He's, he's this, right? He's a good boy, right? And growing up, I always felt like there was something missing. I always felt like I wasn't enough because one, I didn't ask, right, for attention. I didn't put myself out there for attention in my family, my parents. And two, because I just felt like, you know, I was just in the middle. I'm in the middle. I'm not very awesome. I'm not very bad. I'm just in the middle. And so inside. So who's the golden child in your family? <laughs> like the golden child. The golden child is my older sister. Right? So she's okay. the oldest. And then you got the rebel. That's my brother who's older than me. And then the little princess, uh, my younger sister. Mm. And I'm just a forgotten child. That's all I am. Right? And so for so long, at least, I walked around with like a cup, right? If you could imagine, you know, if you're like, a, you know, the beggars we see in the street, they're holding up a cup asking for money. I walked around. I was a beggar in love, right? I was a beggar in love and happiness. So I would walk around and I would ask people, you know, am I good enough? Do you love me? Uh, make me happy, right? And that's what I thought was how the world worked. And, you know, questions for the viewers, like how many of you are walking around like that looking for validation, external validation to know how, how worthy are you? And so when I walked around with this cup, please, and I finally found a girl, you know, at the tender age of 19, right? Late bloomer, right? And she poured love into my cup and it was great. But what I didn't realize here, Elise Anne, was that my cup had holes in it. Mm. So when that love comes in, it just trickles out and I kept asking for more and more and more. 
And it wasn't until I realized that she couldn't give anymore that our relationship died after three years and my cup shattered. Oh. I looked at my, at my cup and I'm like, holy crap, what's my life? Who am I? Who is Richard Fu? But it's amazing that your first relationship actually lasts for three years. I was expecting you to say like three days or three months. <laughs> uh, I'm not that useless. <laughs> right? I'm, good. I'm very good with building relationships, right? Whether that's friendships, whether that's partnerships, whether that's you know, uh, the real intimate relationships. And so, yeah. You know, first time, the first relationships are like just trial and error, right? It's like you don't know what you want. And the fact that you can last for three years, that's good. So, yeah. actually, I want to talk about a little bit about your heritage because you are yeah. Chinese in, no, you are Chinese and then you were born in Vietnam, right? Well, parents are from Vietnam, yeah. And then they came here. But you're born here, yes, right? In Australia. Yeah. So, you have a very interesting last name, Fu. At first, I thought you you are Viet Vietnamese, but actually you're not. So tell us about that growing up stage. You're like, you're neither Chinese, you're Vietnamese. And so what are you? Like, do you have this identity crisis? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, right? Because it's really important, right? And this is especially important for anyone who comes from, we'll say, uh, you know, another culture, another race, another heritage that's, and maybe they're born um, in the Western country. And plus now it's like so much going on with refugees and yes. your parents are literally refugees. So let's talk about this. How did you actually feel, how they felt? And, you know, you who wants to be put out of their own country, right, to be honest. So can you mm. share a little bit with us on that? Yeah. yeah, and so for them, I mean, my dad held back a lot of, like, hatred, right? Mm -hmm. and he still does. I think he still has bits of it there against, like, the communists. And so he would he – would, really really dislike you know the vietnam that we know today right mm. and it's almost like must have been like 40 years at least right before he finally like worked up the the, the courage to actually go back to vietnam mm. right and experience it wow. because you know my family back then at least is that you know we, we were actually very very well off right my, my grandfather owned like a rice paddy field right and so then in we, china no, in, in Vietnam. Vietnam. Mm. Uh, yeah. And then so when the communists came, they took everything, right? Took everything from my dad, took everything from my family. And so that's why my dad held a lot of anger inside, right? Which kind of passes down to me and the kids as well. And, you know, he didn't show it that much, but that was okay. And for me, it was growing up here it was really, really weird because, you know, I mean, I'm Australian, I'm Chinese, I'm also Vietnamese because I speak Vietnamese at home right oh really interesting yeah yeah and and so and what's even more interesting here i get this at least is that my mom and my dad know chinese as well we know cantonese a little bit and they would mix in vietnamese with cantonese words right and i wouldn't know yeah, you won't blend well in singapore than we have <laughs> yeah, so. yeah and so they would say stuff in vietnamese and then throw in a cantonese word and i didn't know it was a cantonese word until i <laughs> to my vietnamese friends like what are you saying and like you know this right i forget what it was and it's like no that's not a vietnamese word right and so and i told you about this before offline is like you know i would go try and hang out with the vietnamese kids the vietnamese kids find out actually you're speaking cantonese no you're not fully vietnamese there's some chinese in you because you're not dark enough to be vietnamese either right and so they wouldn't like me and then i go hang out with the chinese kids right during school or in university chinese kids are like hang on a second you're Chinese, born here, but you don't know how to speak Chinese. You can't be Chinese, right? So what are you? And I, oh, I speak Vietnamese. And oh, no, you're Vietnamese. We don't want to talk to you anymore, right? And I get cut out from there. And then the Aussies are like, you know, you don't look very Aussie. You don't look very white, Richard. So I don't think you're Aussie either. And, you know, so it, every, and I always I really hate this question. Not hate. It's just annoying sometimes. Like people will ask, so where are you from, Richard? And I'll say, you know, I'm from Australia. And then they'll, they'll be like, no, no, no. We're talking about like originally where are you from? I'm like, yeah, I'm born in Australia, so I'm Australian. But yes, my heritage is this. And so growing up, I was always confused. I didn't know if I was Chinese. I didn't know if I'm Vietnamese or if I'm supposed to be Australian. And on top of that, all three probably wouldn't even accept me, right? So I'm, a, I'm an outcast. So right. it goes back to what you said earlier on. You're like the forgotten child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because of that, I would... And this is the thing also with the identity crisis, which I'm just realizing now as we're talking, is that I would try and be a chameleon. Here, yeah. at least. I'd be a chameleon. It's like, all right, I'm going to be Chinese today, right? Hang out with the Chinese people. And then I'm going to be Aussie today. And throw, and then you see me because I talk, I throw in a lot more mates and all these other Aussie terms in. 
And it's just, I would try to do everything I could to please everyone else because I needed to know that I was good enough. I needed to know that I wasn't alone. I needed to know that, you know, um, I will be accepted, right? Because that's what I wanted so badly. And for so long, I, I, I walked around like that thinking I needed to be accepted. But then after that breakup with my first, you know, girlfriend, I hit that path here at least. I hit a path where I looked at my life and I, at 22, right, I asked myself, Richard, you know, what the hell would happen if no one, if no girl, no one wanted to be with you for the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. right? And I, I want the viewers to actually think about this question as they ask themselves here as well, is that you know, if no one wants to be in your life, you know, what would that look like? And I can only see two, two visions, right, at least. All I saw was vision one was, I still continue to be a chameleon and I try and impress people and try to make people feel good and try to accept, get accepted by them, but I wouldn't be happy because right? I don't get to be who I am, right? Or I go down the other path and I said, you know what? Screw it, Elise. If everything else, no one else wanted to be my friend, no one else wanted to be connected with me, then what, how, what kind of life could I live? I just promised myself at that moment, I'm going to live the happiest goddamn life I can because if I don't, you know, then I'm going to miss out. And What's even better is if someone comes and wants to join me, if they just add on top of it, they make my life just that much better, but I'm already happy by myself. You know, what you've just said about like basically worrying about what other people will think of you and you be that chameleon. I think a lot of women are like this, therefore they don't allow themselves to say yes when they really want to say yes and no, when mm. they really want to say no. And it's interesting that as a man, you're bringing this up. So I'm just curious, are you the one of the rarest men who feels like this? Or generally most men do feel like because most of our audience are women. And I think, you know, if men and women can understand each other better and actually to realize that we're actually just the same, then we can love each other just the way we are and we can be ourselves and not pretend to be somebody we are not like chameleon. And especially, you know, in the dating scene, women would try to, you know, make themselves the woman that the man wants. But mm -hmm. in fact, the man does not want a woman like this. So there's so much miscommunication and misunderstanding. Yeah. So are men, most men thinking like you, but they just put it like hush, hush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I think you know when you say put it hush hush, it's actually a bit more than that. A lot of men will not tell, not even open up to this. They some most men probably don't even know they have this. Right? Some men and they, they, they try and put up a face. They try and put up a mm. face. It's just like a, I'm not afraid of a girl saying no to me. I'm not afraid of getting rejected at least, right? And deep down, then they go home, they cry because they get rejected, right? Do they? <laughs> <laughs> right, probably. I don't know. Maybe I've done that too. And so men do go through this too because if anything, if you think about it, I mean, for women, it's important to feel connected and feel a belonging, a sense of belonging. But for men, it's even more important because men want to be seen as, you know, like leaders, right? And for you to be a leader, you need to have that person or the, the, that group that's going to follow through with you. But if you don't have a tribe behind you, if you feel like you're by yourself and you, it's not, you know, you're not being a leader if you're by yourself, you're just being an outcast, Right, and that's what men are really afraid of being isolated, right? Because then, then they're their target, right? Well, if there's a leader, then they actually have a group of a tribe to follow through and really follow where they want to go, right? And that's what a man really wants. A really man really wants to be, you know, just the one who's at the front, who's getting respected for what he does, knows what he's doing and where he's taking his life, and of course, on top of that, is being supported by people who who loves him the most, right? And knowing that. You know, times might not be certain, but this is what we're going to do. And we, we'll fight, we'll make a way. We'll always make a way. Mm. So the men who come to you, mm -hmm. are they having problems expressing themselves? Or mm. they have yeah, problem a not expressing themselves too much? You know, like, <laughs> and like what you said about sometimes they express themselves so much is because they want to boast, right? Like, mm -hmm. so they talk too much. So there's this other persona of men. Mm. And this other persona is they don't talk so much, you know, like mm -hmm. they just put everything hush-hush. So what kind of men come to you? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and it's actually interesting, like, now we're actually not just attracting men, we're attra attracting women to come along as well. And mm. what's interesting is, and this is what's common in both, is that they're the ones that are lacking the confidence, right? We're, we're talking about mm. the men and women who say maybe a woman's listening here and they, 
they just want to learn how to stand up for what they really believe in. Because so many times, like you're saying, it's like, you know, you want to say no, but then you're just forced to say yes because your friends are asking you to do it. And you feel all bad if you don't do it. But for a man and a woman, it's all about coming down to confidence and knowing that, you know, I think most of them are actually thinking too much in their own head, right, to actually yeah. be able to do anything. And, they, 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 and you know, you know this, Elise, is that we just think and think and think and think, and then nothing actually happens. And because of that, you know, just and then you think on top of that, it's like, how come I didn't do this? How come I didn't do that? Right? And at the end of the day, it comes down to just working on their confidence so that they have the fullest belief mm-hmm. within themselves, the faith within themselves to know that whatever they're going to do, it's going to be fine and they're going to work it out and they're going to make a way to make it happen and so yeah, yeah it's really that confidence to one i think uncover what their real values are right like you know spiritually the people here are, you know we think we know what, what our values are but and this is what's interesting is you go through experiences where you're going to crack open you know yourself every every so often right and it's i call it like the, like being an onion right and the onion has layers and so you know when, you, when you're doing personal development, you, you first hit that first layer and you're like, oh, wow, I accept everything about myself and I, I love myself. I love myself, right? And then you get to a point where all of a sudden you, you hit the ceiling and then it just suddenly cracks and your life cracks in half and you're like, oh, whoa, right? And you, you question yourself like, I thought I loved everything about myself, but I didn't know I didn't love that or I didn't accept that or I didn't, didn't see that part. And now, now I see that this value is actually really important to me. This is important for me because I've just recently hit that point where you know, I didn't know really how important my family was until I hit this point with you know my ex fiance right where it was just becoming an issue and you know it's it's only then that I realized my family is really important and that's an example of like you know where you crack that layer and you open yourself up and you realize there's actually more to learn and more to experience about yourself. So like you talked about your ex fiance and you talked about um, early on about. Uh, this is my word, like sort of like feeling like a fraud because, you know, now you're a dating coach. So are you feeling like a fraud again? <laughs> now that I like question. That's a very, oh, I love how, how you just uh, straight in there. And <laughs> it's a very good question. And yes, I mean, I'm going to be honest here. It's like, if you're a coach and you've not felt like you're a fraud sometimes, then you're, you're being complacent. And this is my own perspective on it. You're being complacent thinking that, you know, you know everything. And when you think you know everything, that's when you're most vulnerable right in in a bad space because then that's when you get smashed by someone saying actually the universe does something shows you you don't know anything right and this is what happens and so you know of course i felt like a fraud and you know in that space i try not to actually you know engage with like my clients i'll put off i'll, I'll shift our course so when that happened to me and i felt like a fraud i felt horrible i wanted to deal with it i said to myself and i promised myself i'm not going to serve someone right if i'm feeling like this about myself and so the best thing that I can do is to let's, you know, email, call them, whatever, and shift the calls, shift our interviews. You know, and I had a lot of interviews and, and calls to shift as well. And, you know, I gave myself that one week to just feel like a fraud and it's okay. And then just be like, you know, work us through that, sit through that and just embrace it. And then after that, you realize and you start pulling in all the things that say, you know, yes, it feels like that. Yes, you feel crap. But at the end of the day, you're not a fraud. You're just you. And everyone goes through these kind of things. and this experience for me has been the most like life defining because then you know, God and the spirit and the universe gives you these life defining events so that you can experience it, go through it and then help someone else. You can be more compassionate towards your clients, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you don't go through the hell period, if you don't go through like almost bankruptcy, then you really have no experience. You may have the knowledge, but you may not have the experience to show compassion that, hey, you know, I totally get it and, you know, walk them, walk them through. And this is how you create your own signature program and not by copying someone else. You have your own five-part, six-part, six-step system because you have gone through it. So mm-hmm. actually another question is, I mean, if you work on personal development, you kind of like take failures and break up with a pinch with a pinch of salt. You know, the other day I was sending my husband to work and it was like midnight. And, you know, during those midnights, you have all these relationships stuff you know calls and there you go yeah. i mean i don't engage myself with at that level at, anymore but when i was in my early 20s i used to cry over men i used to not understand like this is it i'm gonna be a nun and you no know, men would cheat on me and then wow blah 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 and the same thing right and it's still going on like 
women would walk in and find their boyfriends with another woman and this and that. So this question just pops up for the benefit of our audience because mostly mm -hmm. are women. As a man's point of view, why do you think men cheat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> wow, uh, that's a really, really, really left field question. But yes, um, I think... Because no, it's like, well, I don't understand this, right? It's mm -hmm. like, that obviously there are cracks in the relationship. Because to me, if you don't love the woman anymore, then just leave and go find someone else and be and, and have this clean cut. Like, we are at that space right now and we just know, right? Mm -hmm. But for people who are still developing, and we are still developing ourselves, but at that, that vibration, then why do you think men have this? I mean, I speak for women as well. Some, some women, you know, <laughs> do the same, but regardless mm -hmm. of gender. Like, why is it so hard to just make a decision? <laughs> That's a good question because if you ask yourself, I mean, most people right, are afraid to make a decision because they're afraid of making the wrong decision. Right. And, and that scares them even more than making a decision. And we both know, right? And, every, and if you're listening, they probably work through them, themselves a lot is that the worst decision you can make is making no decision. But sometimes we still get ourselves caught up in, you know, what if this is the wrong thing and then this happens and then, you know, my, my husband leaves me or, you know, my, my boyfriend cheats on me or, you know, blah, 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 blah right? It's, we're always afraid of making the wrong decision because even if we look down further deeper than that, what, what drives that, right? What drives that? And if I was to think about myself, what drove that is you know, for a man, it's like I'm afraid, and this is probably the, most, the case for most men, I think, is I'm afraid to make the wrong decision because mm -hmm. then I'll look like a failure and that means I'm an embarrassment. I'm not a man. Right. I'm not a man if I got it wrong, right? right, right, right. Just, just so you just got out of a breakup, and so if this woman walks in, because this is what I've heard, and she found the guy, it's like two stories. The, the husband cheated on the wife. Three times. So took him in, took him in, and finally she left. The girlfriend walks into some pub and found the boyfriend with the girl, you know? And so it's all these cheating spouses, cheating partners. How can the woman at this phase, what can she do so that she can be better about herself? Like at this point, she might be thinking, oh shit, there's something wrong with me, right? Mm -hmm. So from a man's perspective, how can you console this woman? Mm. And so I think the women would go in one or two paths, right? They either like turn around, they're like, God, that guy's a douchebag. Oh, he's a blah, 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 right? All these expletives, right? And either way, it's about taking responsibility, right? And then the other one, other flip side is like, maybe they're taking too much responsibility. It's like, I'm not worth it. I'm not good enough for love. I'm not this, blah, 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 right? And so you know, what do you mean, let's backtrack. What do you mean by take responsibility? Take responsibility for the fact that he has cheated? You know, that you're at where you're at right mm -hmm. and it's not saying that it's your fault that he cheated it's just you know we, we take responsibility of what led us here like there's a reason why people cheat right so say for example men and you know they need certain things fulfilled in their life for example if you're in a relationship and this is what happened to me right is that you know after a while in the relationship the the my partner would criticize right and maybe she wasn't criticizing maybe she's just saying oh how come you don't do this or how come you don't do that or that person does that right <laughs> and then it's kind of like well i feel like i'm getting criticized and then i i feel like instead of being up here feeling confident i feel like down 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 and until i'm into the earth right and this is the thing is that and this you know for the women here like you know gonna maybe roll their eyes right? but men need to feel like they're admired they need to feel like they're appreciated even if it's the smallest thing even if it's me taking the rubbish out if a woman just <laughs> oh richard thank you for taking you know, like you don't have to do it like that but just like you know thanks for taking the rubbish out it means a lot right and men feels like damn straight i did a good job right and they're like puppies so the moral of the story is men are like children so just treat them like children <laughs> yes yes and and i'm not the only one to say this i actually learned this here from tony robbins right and he was saying that men need appreciation and it's kind of like there's a scientific study i forget what it was but it's like if you criticize someone once right and you probably heard about this at least and is that if you criticize someone once in order for you to bring it back to balance Right, for them to feel okay again, you know, I think it's like you have, they, you have to praise them like five times, right? Or something more than that, right? So it's not an even scale. So if you continually criticize and then you say, oh, but I did say thank you for that thing once, it doesn't equal 
the man still holds on to that criticism and makes him feel like he's not enough. And when he feels like he's not enough, right, he's going to go find something else to go make him feel like he's enough, make him feel like he's a man. So most people go into work, right? That's why like, I'd rather be at work and do overtime than go home to my wife who's just going to yell at me all the time or nag me to do this. So just a light bulb moment here. So women, I'm not taking your side. There are many reasons why men cheat, but because I think this is for mostly women. And I think if, if that happens, like what Richard said, you got to go into yourself and ask yourself if, you're, if you need to take responsibility in that side, if your husband strays or whatever, because it takes two hands to clap. Mm. Sometimes when I'm, I'm unaware of how we behave, like sometimes I may be really loud and I don't know because it's just you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think there are many reasons why men cheat and women cheat, but I think what my, my thing is, if should you be the recipient of it, then you need to take responsibility, responsibility, not for his actions, but for your actions and see how you have contributed. Because, I mean, to be honest, when two people come together, they are really in love. Mm. They would never have thought, like, I'm going to divorce or I'm going to break up with you. No. Mm. So then something along the lines have happened. Yeah. So exactly. how did you cope with your breakup then? <laughs> and this is the funny part here, at least, and is that you know how I cope with it. So I, I broke up, right, after – and the reason why I broke up was in, the, in a pure – frustration moment it was also because i saw how much suffering she was going through and how much suffering i was going through and i didn't communicate this across clearly but i said you know if you're suffering that much you know then why are we together right and then she she just got angry right she got angry she just cut it off they find suffering well to a point where you know she would like get anxious right she would get anxious she would have shallow breathing. She would go into a, a, a negative mental state and go into the blaming game, right? With blaming a lot of stuff on me, even though I didn't do anything. So, so do you think she's in this state because of you or because she's just like this? Or, okay, let's just vice versa. I mean, whatever yeah. your suffering is, is it because of her or is it because of you personally? I never thought it was because of me. But if someone keeps doing that to you <laughs> consistently right you're gonna feel like it is right you're gonna feel like it is especially if they keep saying it's your fault at least it's all your fault it's your fault this your fault that and so when that happened i mean i went back home to my parents right mm -hmm. I, I reached out and this is the most important thing here for people who are going through this stage or who you know a friend is going through you, they, they, you need to reach out and most people don't want to reach out i didn't want to reach out right? i didn't want to tell my family that this is what's happening i didn't want to tell my friends what's happening because i felt like you know I felt like because it's not just a girlfriend, right? It's a fiance. It means you're about yes. to get married. So yes. is that worse? <laughs> yes, right. And it's like, oh, what about the face, right? What's everyone going to think yeah. about me? And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. I feel so hurt. I I, I can't hide this stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to ask for help, right? And this most people don't do this because they're scared, and that's okay. But if you're aware of this and you know your friend's going through it or you're going through it, then they need your help. Right, and so I reached out to my family that night. We had a what I call family emergency dinner. Right? <laughs> oh, like all oh, my siblings came in, and then you know we we're all talking, and, and you know I'm trying to like lay out the timeline of things that happened because everyone's like, "What's going on?" I don't, I'm so confused, right? And then I reached out to my friends, and then that night my friend would come over, and you know we just hung out and we just watched Batman vs Superman, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah," really angry right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then after that a few days two days later i had this moment of clarity that i was like you know what at least then you know the reason and the, the way i dealt with it was to transform and use that energy you use, use that frustration into something productive and that's where i poured it into my business and you know the ultimate man and so from there two days later i quit my job right? i quit my corporate job and i was like the only reason why i stayed in that job was because she needed that security she needed it more mm. And now that she was gone, I looked at him like, why am I here? Why am mm. I here? Makes sense. And I realized I bullshitted myself, right, into saying it's her fault that she, I'm staying here. The real fault is because of me and I'm just scared because I've never done a business before. Mm. And, and then, yeah, so I quit then. And you said something early on about you took a couple of weeks or days to get over yourself. Mm. And so people who extensively stay in this period, do you think that actually – it becomes like a decision to torture yourself. It's no longer the griefing stage. 
That's a very good question. And, you know, I know I'm going to cop like some heat for, for whatever I say, right? And I think it's, it's depends how long. Like for me, I took a week off, right? And I, when I say it took a week off, it didn't mean, you know, I took one or two days off at work, right? My boss at that time, he said, Richard, why are you here? You, you should just take your time off, whatever you need, just do it. Right. I didn't because I, I got really clear. And it's because I've spent seven years and many thousands of dollars working on myself. So I know kind of what to do. But this is the thing here, at least, and is that for people who are going through that, it is, right? I believe it's a decision for you to continue to feel sad about yourself. Right. And yes, there's going to be times like I'll tell you that week, you know, first three days, four days, you know, I was on, I was like, yeah, I'm on fire. I know what to do now. I feel free. I'm going to go do it. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm like, boom, right? Just like a bomb went off in my room. And, and Saturday, I'm like, I felt really lonely, right? I felt like, mm-hmm. what's going on? And, you know, I would be doing this. I would be doing that. And, you know, for people who are going through that, just understand that this grieving process takes a while, right? But mm-hmm. it depends on you. I mean, like, I, I can't really advise people to say, you know, you should, you should get through it in a week, right? But I advise people that, you know, you really need to go out there, get help, get the support from your friends, from your family, people that you you lean on, lean on people because people want, people want that too. People want to be there for you, right? And you know, however long that takes, you know, it's up to you. And you eventually, it's all about preparing for you to make a decision for yourself that either you're going to accept this and this is going to be your new identity that you're sad, you're not good enough, you're this or this or this, right? Or you're going to eventually hit a point where you're like you know what i'm sick and tired of feeling sorry for myself i'm sick and tired of being this sucky person that no one wants to hang around and just negative nancy i'm just gonna go do what i really want to do and i took it as that i took it as this is my opportunity like a phoenix rising out of the ashes to go rebuild my life to go find out once again and solidify who the hell is richard Fu and what does he really want to be and that's decision and that's why i made the decision quick and so that's why the the transition has been quick right mm. but for her right she's still going through it she's still trying to process it she's still saying you know i miss you and all this other stuff but it's because it's a decision that we've made to not let go right i've let him go because i know that it was not going to serve me and so you gotta right. ask yourself that right. question and you know it's funny where you say because i think men can compartmentalize their emotions better than women we might need to process it and they're not willing to let go and they're like oh why me poor me and to be honest this why me poor me state is quite addictive because it's very dramatic and most people are drama mamas you know like they're just drama queens and then you as a woman and then you see your man sort of like moved on in a week and then probably i mean I don't know, some are so quick that they have another girlfriend right now. And then the woman are thinking, oh shit, you really don't love me. Mm. That's really something. So I think women go through so much crap, like what you say, like inside your mind. And now we know it's not that the man don't love you, but it's just that he understands logically there's no point hanging on there. So for the women who are listening out there who are going through this breakup or, you know, someone you know, just let it go, you know. Mm. And I mean, don't want to jump in here. Like, yeah. yeah, it's the letting go. It's easy to just say to someone, just let it go. And they're like, yeah. thanks. I know, but I can't let <laughs> go. Right? I know, but I can't let go. Right. And, so, and then it's, and for me, I mean, I just said this to myself, right. And this is what I tell a lot of people who go through something like this is just be with it. Right. Just if you feel sad, it's okay to feel sad. Right. It's a problem when you feel sad for like two, you know, a week right? Every day for a week, feeling sad, then there's a problem. Maybe that's where you need to go find some help, find a coach, find Mm -hmm. a therapist, find whatever, a friend, right? A really good friend. And, you know, just feel it, right? And just let yourself feel it because you'll feel it for a few hours. And then, you know, the biggest, the worst thing we could ever do, the worst thing that anyone could ever do is go get, uh, go be distracted because that doesn't deal with with shit, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it's funny, at least when I was talking to some of my friends, well, actually, when I tell my brother, my brother's like, Hey, bro, you want to go drinking now then? And I'm like, dude, I don't do that, right? And so people do this. People do things like they just distract themselves from the issue, right? But if you just sit there and just be with it and just see what your mind's trying to tell you, like, oh, I can't believe I didn't do this or didn't do that. You can either buy into it or you can just write it down and say, oh, that's interesting that, that I feel like that. But I, and I think I feel I'm in a different space more because when, I've, when I caught off this one, it's like I've done everything I could. I've done everything I could and I don't have any regrets. There are things I could have done better. Yes. 
Yeah, yes, definitely. But I know at every moment I did my absolute best and I try to make it work as hard as I can. And so that's why I guess I've been, I've been able to move through quicker because most people don't always think that they have regrets, they missed out on something, they could have done something better. Yes, you can do something better. But at that point in time, and you need to understand this if you're watching here, is that you are doing the best that you can with the information you have at that very time, every freaking time. Everyone is doing their very best. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, there's a single person who really goes out there and, and tries not to do their best in that moment. Right? So if we believe in that, then it helps you move forward quicker. Awesome, awesome. Alrighty, so I know you only work with men, but I believe uh, women can also take away lots of diamonds and gems from you because we don't want to think how men think like, right? So mm -hmm. where can we find you and your good work? Rich yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, Elise, for inviting me on here. Right? And of course, to the viewers here who are watching and listening, means a lot to me. And I hope you took a lot away from this. The best place to find me is over my website. It's richardfu.com. Or you can even just jump on you know, social media, type me in. I'm in there. And of course, you know, there's also the podcast show you can jump in where I'm doing very similar to Elise, right? Just asking questions from really amazing guests, just like Elise, whose episode's coming out very soon, by the way. So make sure you check that one out. And yeah, that's the best place to find me at richardfood.com. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So thank you, Richard, for joining us and sharing your gems so openly with the breakups and how, you know, what we can learn from uh, your breakup <laughs> so that we can... <laughs> Go through life, easy and grace. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so thank you for joining us in another wonderful episode. If you are not part of our spiritual community, please go ahead and join us. Uh, type in the spiritual entrepreneurs on Facebook and you'll see my face there and just request to join. So now it's your turn. Please leave us a comment below and let us know what you thought and how did you go through your breakup and how long did it take for you to get over it and you know, what's your best solution for anything, like especially relationships, cheating, <laughs> breakups. <laughs> Let us know. We are happy to hear from you. All right. So you take care and I'll see you soon. Bye.